so glad you're here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, um, uh, the, the overview for the event says at the very first line that you're, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies, focusing particularly on Spawn. So I just thought, let's just go straight there. And maybe just uh, have you take a few minutes to talk about Spawn, the development of Spawn, and what Spawn is. And that'll kick us off. Sh I'll, should I talk about it? OK. So um, Spawn is what we call our AI baby. And that's kind of like the headline grabbing, like AI baby. Um, but what it really is is it's a metaphor for some experiments that Matt and I and Jules Laplace um, were doing with machine learning and music. Um, and so I guess three years ago, um, we were given a grant by the German government to celebrate the death anniversary of Beethoven. Um, so 2020 is the 250th. They're really glad he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, 2020 is the 250th, I think, death anniversary of Beethoven. So they're doing this project to kind of, um, you know, I, I think the concept is like, what would the Beethovens of today be doing? And I don't have the hubris to say that I am the Beethoven of today, but anyways, that's kind of like what the what the project was about. And so they were um, giving out small grants for artists to. Um, to pursue research projects that don't really like fit into the practice normally, or you might like we might not have the kind of like economic incentive to kind of like go down that path. Um, so anyways, it, it was really nice to, to be given the resources to, hi uh, to, to buy some hardware and to hire um, Jules. Um, Jules is a developer that we met while we were living in California, and he's like just a badass crack developer um, who also is a musician. So being able to kind of like share a musical language and have, um, have him understand kind of what some of our goals were early on was really great. Um, and so yeah, we just started messing around with our own, creating our own data sets, um, kind of cobbling together some different software that we found on GitHub, and uh, started messing around. And for the first six months, we basically um, just, it just sounded like shit. <laughs> it was really awful. Um, we almost gave up. And then we um, had a couple breakthroughs. So we started using sample RNN, which is a recurrent neural network technique. Um, and that's kind of when things started to sound interesting, I think, the first time. And that's the track on Proto called Birth, because um, I think we could really start to hear the logic of the network. Um, I don't know how, much, how far I should go into detail. Should I keep going? Yeah, I, I, I keep going, if only for the fact that the, I, I think you're right in saying that sample RNN was like a breakthrough moment, but actually the bulk of the work that we did on the record didn't involve sample RNN at all. That's and true. And I'd only use that, like make that distinction because specifically like the the issues with, like the, 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 the correlation between this technology and co like what we classically understand as like sampling technology is something we've actually tried to step aside from right like there's really has anyone seen the like um like 24-hour death metal youtube uh things right like, like that that that's sample rnn right so it's it's uh the, the the basic idea is you can you can train a network on like a, a piece of sand and then it will try and anticipate what will come next on the basis of what came before and it creates like a pretty pretty interesting illusion of um illusion of development or, or generation um but Speaking more to actually your point, uh, we were desperately trying to get away from this idea of kind of just recreating something, um, as impressive as that te technique is. And most of the bulk of the really interesting stuff that I would consider to be spawn um, is more to do with um, us training uh, neural networks on a corpus of, of, of sounds that were created by us and our collaborators and oftentimes audience members for different performances that we've been so doing. So maybe we should zoom back for a second. Okay, so, sorry, we just like just got off the plane. Yeah. I'm like, okay, jumping in. Um, so when we started the project, we didn't really have like a clear idea of what neural networks could do. And so we really wanted to just kind of get our hands dirty with it so that we could build a kind of conceptual framework and understand kind of our stance on the technology. Um, and when we started researching it, we found that a lot of people were using it to kind of, um, like you guys have seen like Infinite Bach and things like this, where it's like you train a neural network on um, an existing composer's corpus, usually like um, turned into MIDI data, and then you can create like Bach forever or music that kind of sounds like Bach forever. So there were a lot of examples like that, um, a lot of examples where, um, 
uh, especially like you know corporate examples where they're just kind of like hoovering up um, anonymous audio um, or anonymous kind of like MIDI files online and kind of you know training on that. So from like a very early kind of um, point, we decided that we wanted to A, focus on audio material because we didn't want to abstract audio into MIDI files. And there are many like aesthetic and political reasons for that that we can get into. And then the um, the other thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to create our own data sets. We didn't want to use anonymous or, um, you know, like a lot of universities have kind of like really large data sets that you can use. So those were two like really early kind of constraints that we put on the project. Do you want to explain why we did that? Or? Well, just, um, just to interject, how long did it take for you to start to get to that realization of wanting to use uh, custom data sets versus like uh, pretty early on? Pretty early on, if only for the fact that, that a lot of like the, like pretty much all of the precedents that we could mm. and most of the the software libraries that were being released were focusing explicitly on on MIDI, right? To the extent that when you speak to most developers or most companies, when they think about machine learning and music, they think about ingesting MIDI and spitting out MIDI. Mm -hmm. The vast majority, the, like that's a, the, a common, a common, and that goes back to the the eighties, right? Which is why music from a very specific period of time uh, is often used in as an example for this because it's flattered by the score. So like. You know, someone like a Beethoven, you know, this is when the score was kind of at its apex, when the score was often even valued above the live performance. Um, and then, you know, over the last hundred years or so, there are many kind of musical parameters that aren't very well captured in MIDI data. And those are a lot of the things that I care a lot about, like, you know, context or timbre or things like this. And was there an intermediate part, like uh, where you looked at, you considered uh, data sets that were kind of WAV files, but not custom made? Um, not other than like just kind of uh, testing the system, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean. Like th there was definitely some points where you're like, oh, I've just got a, f a folder here. Like let's mm. th throw this folder in and just see as kind of like a yeah a way of like mm. testing the water. But it became it really pretty, clear pretty that pretty it was kind of like sampling, even though yeah. you're not like you're not physically sampling. It's so similar. You're like sampling the vibe of something mm. so heavily um, that it became kind of like a. Mm, it felt like a legal issue almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I want to return to this, like, this, uh, this. What I think that you're t like pointing out a little bit is this, like, reanimating the dead, mm. kind of like taking this archive and like continually kind of like uh, refreshing it, or t not even refreshing it, but just like propping it up and keeping it alive. But just going back to um, Spawn a little bit and the way that you describe her um, is that. In all of the, because I binge watched all these like interviews and read, <laughs> read a whole bunch of stuff to prepare. <laughs> um, but um, one of the one of the things that jumped out at me is that uh, you're very quick to insist on a uh, spawn as a metaphor, uh, and I guess I'm just interested in in that in that like uh, this this um, this need to assert that spawn is a metaphor, and not. The, the thing itself, you know. Um, so well, I'm, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a little bit kind of allergic to like some of the kitsch around AI narratives, and I'm, a, a, was a little bit worried by using the baby metaphor that people would think that we actually were like having this baby, and you know what I mean? Like there, there's, uh, yeah, with like all of the kind of fembots and stuff that we see <coughs> in culture. I didn't want to perpetuate that further, so mm. that's why I was trying to be clear about that. And also kind of trying to under, trying to explain that it's not just one thing. It's like, it's multiple things. It's multiple processes. It's not like one fixed thing. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing I think is that when most people talk, I mean, we're being kind of polite in using machine learning and like not bringing up the AI question, right? But like in, in most... In most conversations, most of the kind of proxy wars happening around this are all in the realm of metaphor. Because mm -hmm. nobody actually, like most people having conversations about this have no idea about what technically is going on. <laughs> right. And so that's, that's always the tricky thing in our kind of case, I think. And it's different with us individually, but collectively it, we kind of have this similar experience. Is like on the one angle, you're putting out a popular record that we understand is going to be, you know, pushed out and hopefully teenagers care enough to like come to festivals. You know, that, that's like that thing that like pays the bills. And then there's this other side, which is your kind of academic facing where, you know, like Holly's writing her PhD thesis on this, so you literally can't bullshit, right? Mm. And like same, there's a credibility issue there where 
many people who, of whom I will not name like are, feel completely free to talk utter shit about AI and basically lie to people. I mean, fraudulent claims around the usage of AI in music, you know what I mean? Like, we can't do that because... Mm -hmm. You specifically can't do that because your thesis advisor at Stanford. But I also don't, don't want to do that. I mean, that's no, also okay, not, I know, not I know, interesting. It, like that. Yeah, yeah no, I'm not saying we would do it if we could get away with it, but I'm just, but I'm, but I'm just saying it's like, but it, but it, but we certainly can't do it, you know. And so and so the metaphor is like the one way that you can kind of, you know, and the metaphor was like deliberated over a long period of time to be like this is something that like we can stand behind and and has dual purpose. In the sense that you can talk to someone who knows what they're talking about and be like, no, this is about you know supervised learning training sets, which happens to you know work quite well with the baby metaphor. And for the average person who's not really going to care too much about the weeds, we're not putting out some like Terminator, you know. 20th century kitsch bullshit, right? Like that's, that, that's also why we haven't created like an animated spawn who's yeah, like yeah. this like towering baby like making music, you know. Like, <laughs> although that probably like would have gone yeah. viral. Or There's something. gonna be I mean, many of those this year, I promise you. <laughs> Not from us, but yeah. <laughs> well, can you talk a little bit about then why you've given spawn a gender? Like why? She's this has she, come, yeah. Like, this has come up a lot. I mean, I think. Well, the first reason, the reason is the first trainings that I was doing with Spawn um, were with my voice. So then the first kind of utterances I heard from Spawn were my voice, and I identify as she, and so I heard myself reflected back to myself. And you know, some people have had issue with this because of the history of um, female digital assistants um, being treated poorly and then that translating into the real world like into the kind of like human world treating female assistants poorly um, and I, I think that that's a real issue but I'm also you know part of this project is about trying to create a kind of a counter narrative um, and, a, and, and another vision for this and so I don't feel like I have to be kind of shackled by that necessarily so for me I just saw myself reflected actually th that's it I mean I, th I think I think you you're right, and you believe what you're saying is right. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but I think it's older than that, actually, because we haven't told this before. But I think we actually can say this now. The original, like the, sorry, I'm, I'm not going off script. Um, yeah, I he, am he off is script. going off script. <laughs> no, no, no. So the first time, even before the B Beethoven grant, we were approached, incidentally, by Blade Runner because they were remaking the film. Yes, no, 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 I'll finish it. The, <laughs> yeah, no, we were we were approached by Blade Runner because they're making the film, and then of course, like we weren't asked to do the score or anything like interesting. Like, but, but, but like, they they were doing all this stuff around the film, and they wanted to commission art projects. And we worked for like two months. You remember this? We worked for like two months on like a pitch, and the whole pitch was, oh, okay, so it's it's not part of the Blade Runner film, but it's like something that goes alongside. I'm like, oh, what would be really cool is if we did like fan fiction, like counterfactual fan fiction from the Blade Runner story. Because if you go back to Blade Runner, you know, like when you watch that film back, there's all these holes. Like it's not that well, like, what's the word? Like developed a script. It like, looks incredible, but it's like quite basic actually what happens. So there's all these holes in the narrative. And we came up with the story that was like, actually, no, the guy who created the intelligence. It was the pre-story. Yeah, we... D Exactly. Like the prequel to Blade Runner we wrote. Exactly. And we're like, no, actually what happened was the guy was uh, the guy who came up with this uh, was in a research university with his wife. And his wife wanted to take this technology and allow for it to thrive on a separate, par as a separate parallel civilization. Um, and his wife was called Donna, which is a, some obvious people will get reference. that obvious reference. Yeah. Um, and the child was going to be called Spawn. And we totally forgot that and haven't told anyone that. But that was the, that was the original reason. And we're like, oh, yeah, and then we'll get Spawn. And, like, Spawn will be this voice that, you know, was allowed to, to kind of co inter interdependently flourish with, um, uh, with this kind of splinter civilization uh, elsewhere while the world of Blade Runner went to shit. And they but said the they franchise wouldn't let us yeah, yeah. reference their story, even though it was a commissioned for yeah it was the whole thing was which so is also funny silly. when it comes to like data ownership right because the people who remade the film had to license blade runner from blade runner so blade runner whatever the movie was they needed to ask permission from the original license holders of blade runner also to make that thinking film. about like artistic necrophilia which you brought up I yeah, mean, yeah, we'll yeah, get exactly. into that later but 
the all of the kind of like jukebox scenes and all that. Yeah, yeah, totally, that. absolutely. It was like these weird like Frank Sinatra songs with like the Sony logo, like in the. Cl- I don't know who saw that film, the the remake of Blade Runner, but the, but yeah. Anyway, the, but that was actually the genesis, and, and so the idea was there would be a more you know a a, a, a female uh, a splinter civilization done in the form of uh, fan fiction. <laughs> and then it, and it wasn't, yeah, and they didn't like it, so it never happened. Um, well, just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned treating female assistants poorly, and I'm just thinking before we get into the uh, necrophilia, <laughs> and just thinking about uh, the way we treat the living, mm. just as a segue into like, the way that we train our, uh, machine learning models, mm-hmm. um, and just uh, to get you to comment on the, the particular ways that Spawn was was um, trained, as a contrast to something like Susan Bennett, where if you read how she was treated in the training of Siri, is that she's working uh, like four hours a day. It's but that doesn't sound like very long, but it's a really long time to be reciting nonsense sentences. Uh, cleanly and clearly, five days a week for a solid month in order to produce the voice of Siri, you know? And then she's sort of more or less tossed aside and only recovered, you know, years later uh, for various reasons. But the way that Spawn is trained is like obviously operating according to a different kind of logic. And I guess, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about both the public and private uh, performances of training, or maybe they're not all performances, but they're like, it seems like there's different modalities in the way that Spawn's been uh, trained. Yeah, so that's another reason why we use the the kind of baby metaphor because we um, see her being raised by a community of, basically a community of vocalists that we're working with, so our ensemble. So the idea was not to use kind of random data, to use, um, to actually hire people, to name them and pay them for their time. Um, but yeah, of course it gets more complicated as we do public performances. And you know, I think we always just try to be respectful of people's um, privacy um, in that way. I don't know, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the first time we did the, the public, we did, there was a piece called Deep Belief. This was like two years ago. And it was kind of like, um, like a theater piece. And the whole idea was that we had these kind of icons who were all ensemble members who play perform characters, and the characters were in some way symbolic or representative of a different kind of vision of where this technology might go. Um, and th- yeah, so we we had this like congregation, and then they were doing these call and response exercises, and some of which were like people were kind of being coerced or tricked into giving information, um, and others, but, but but the entire time everyone was very, very cognizant of what was going on. Um, and also there's a, there's a big distinction, I think, between um, recording the individual voice of somebody that you can, you know, mm-hmm. th- that you can identify, and recording like the abstract voices of thousands of people. That That's like different in ways that, you know, uh, aren't disinteresting, but like, but yeah, but in terms of but in terms of anyone who like we actually sat down and said you know we want your voice uh, to participate in this record, they're credited and, and we're paid for their time. That was the. That's also kind of like the stoner thought that that, <laughs> that was like this aha moment is like as soon as something becomes captured in, in whatever medium like photo, video, whatever it becomes machine legible, it can become part of a training corpus that can then create something out uh, from its logic. And that seems like something really obvious, but once you kind of come to that conclusion, it's like oh my god, everything like my voice could be modeled from this talk even like if somebody was recording it and then there then you start to get paranoid you know and then you start to kind of you go down the wormhole of like well what does it mean to have a voice what is what is vocal sovereignty like you know voice is also kind of a communal thing like traveling down here I hear this amazing Australian accent that you all share so uh, you know voice is also kind of a shared communal thing that then you perform as an individual so it kind of opened up this whole Pandora's box of um yeah, what does it mean to, what does it mean to have this kind of like audio um, fingerprint? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a um, kind of fear, which is like quickly being realized, which is which is yeah, that your voice can be synthesized from you know, I think it's as little as five seconds of um, of audio. Um, there are like you know scientific demonstrations that through transfer learning and a few seconds of audio, yeah, you can you can pretty much trick someone over the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that, that definitely is uh, terrifying. And it brings up this question of consent, which normally doesn't, yeah, normally doesn't enter into our thinking of um, both the giving up of data and, and it's definitely not something that we think about in terms of the reanimation of data uh, going forward. For like, sure, and I think also because it's on the vanguard, we don't really have proper legislation around it. So like, I mean, the, um, the prison system in the United States is awful. I don't know what it's like here, but it's just really awful in the States. And so there, The Intercept um, released an article a couple years ago where they were talking about how um, prisoners um, were, it was kind of like an opt-in only. If you want to use the um, the phones of this private prison, your voice would be modeled. And then the the company would have this model and then in any kind of like future investigations or whatever, they could be kind of like scraping, trying to listen for your voice. Not only the voice of the incarcerated person, but also whoever they're talking to who's not incarcerated on the other end of the line. So things like that, I think, are just because it's like, it's hap it's all happening in real time that we don't, sometimes the laws like don't catch up in time. Or Mostly don't you, you, can, you can clearly imagine like future employers like acquiring that data set, right? Like so as to be able to screen convicted felons for future employment opportunities, or you know what I mean? Like it, it, it is, it is distressing, um, yeah. and also on the consent issue too, right? That there's like Whitney Houston's going on tour, and presumably never gave consent to tour posthumously, right? We have an example. I mean, th th there's a whole like lecture, whatever thing we give on this too, with like uh, what's his name, like uh, Lil Pump and XXX Tentacion who are the two kind of like SoundCloud trap stars that both sadly died in the last couple of years, who were, whose management and family is giving consent on their behalf to collaborate together posthumously. So there's songs out there with, you know, those two collaborating together, even though they didn't like each other when they were alive. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's like, that stuff's like, that it's done. I saw, I mean, isn't James Dean being reanimated for a movie? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's just, it's over. It's like, it's, I mean, it's not even like bleeding edge. It's just like this, we, yeah. It's this is good. something like, so the reason why I keep using the word <laughs> necrophilia, artistic necrophilia is because Miles Davis, this is a term that he used um, criticizing sampling when kind of hip hop culture started. He's like, oh, this is artistic necrophilia. You should, each generation should create a new sound that reflects their their kind of like current conditions. And arguably hip hop did exactly that. Um, so I think that was maybe a little bit short sighted, but it's also quite prophetic when you look at these kind of like Tupac hologram shows or the kind of like Whitney tour or, um, so anyways, what I think a lot of these kind of like voice modeling or a lot of the kind of like vibe stealing that you can do through machine learning is it does kind of make us question what we do with our kind of shared archive. And maybe this is just something that'll be completely passe in the future, like the way that we look at like playing an old film or something maybe would have been like hideous to someone a couple hundred years ago. Mm. But it's just something that we kind of have to deal with legislatively to together. Mm. Well, and there's no going backwards, right? Like, did you see the article, uh, the, the, the teal funded startup that's uh, crawling the, w scraping the web for faces? Uh, Clearview. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like the, the, the part of the challenge too is like anyone beyond a certain age, most of this information already exists about you and it's kind of hard to roll back, right? Mm. So, so dealing with it, we don't get the luxury of like a clean start. Yeah, and everyone is clutching at pearls like at the, you know, the fact that someone has the audacity to actually do what everyone is already thinking about doing, but no one has done yet and it's yeah I mean the fact that it's it, it already exists as a possibility and it's being really you know the fact that they've thought about it means that it's been realized in private <laughs> they've done it already sure they just yeah. haven't like uh, sold it as a company yet yeah but someone it. else yeah is gone and, and done it and is selling it as a company but that I mean um, maybe this is something to talk about later but just on that particular point that's part of the reason why when again going down this rabbit hole we've both been given pause to start looking a little closer to home and questioning some of the kind of ubiquitous logics of sampling mm. and kind of just general entitlement to media um, that have been kind of commonplace. That has like, that is the countercultural mode since the 1990s, right? That's the countercultural mode that I grew up with is kind of this libertarian individualist ideal that everything is basically mine to play with. So long as I'm, as long as I'm not punching down, 
or whatever, right. whatever that means, whoever arbit arbitrates that, I don't know. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, it, 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 it... Yeah, it's a kind of, like, like negative land or something, like, where it's just what? absorbing stuff from us. And it never loses that cool, yeah. even though... And it's not to kind of, like, erase an entire history of music that we love, and, like, you know, of course, the Pierre Schaeffer and the kind of, like, this liberated sound from its origins and all these kind of things, like, they're really interesting, but it, it's also so time specific i mean when you liberate a sound from its context you also liberate it from its author and from like the cultural and maybe religious context or whatever kind of context that's around it and so yeah i don't know like when we were looking at the history of sampling of course there's tons of egregious examples of you know like you know age of innocence where they take kind of like um, Taiwanese Aboriginal music and make a kind of like Euro trance song out of it and like luckily they take them to the court and then they, they get kind of reimbursed but that kind of logic if you know if, if we don't kind of deal with it now which we really we've done a really kind of shitty job of dealing with sampling mm -hmm. it's like we have two options it's like freedom of information of everything or like you know like hellacious digital rights management from the major label side and like you don't want to choose either of those it's yeah. not like anybody wants to be like a sample cop yeah. you know like, <laughs> like that's also <laughs> not cool like what what is the third mode you yeah. know well maybe to ask that question more specifically and just to ask you matt a little bit about saga um oh, sure. <laughs> which yeah and and just like maybe like w maybe to talk about that project and maybe lessons that you've drawn from it because i noticed that the github repo hasn't been updated in the last four no, years so it feels gone. like it's something that you've <laughs> left behind yeah and uh yeah yeah no I, well, we are i mean it's funny that on the the kind of ownership question. Yeah, for those who don't know, like years ago, uh, I worked on a project called Saga. Um, and the idea is, is basically, it's like a decentralized publishing framework. And the idea is that when an artist or any publisher or anyone who wants to publish something um, publishes their work online, um, it gives you tools to alter it in every discrete location that it exists online. So the idea, the classic example would be you post a track to SoundCloud. Um, that track disseminates across the web, people embed it or whatever. Um, if you took exception to, say, Mercedes-Benz embedding it on their blog for free, um, you have the choice to either take it down everywhere or leave it up. Um, and the idea with Saga was that, no, it's kind of like you had little switches. You can say, no, Mercedes, I don't want you to have it, but this kid can have it here. Um, and then on top of that, because that, that railroad, so to speak, has been built, you can then publish code on top of that to do more interesting things and say, well, no, actually, my song or my video or my text is free everywhere until 200 people view it in one location, at which point in that location you have to pay money to, to view it. And so the part of the idea at the time was looking at like advertising runs the web um, uh, and saying, okay, well, you know, we would do something and then put a bunch of time into it, it's published online, there's not really much of a mechanism for us to make it any kind of, uh, make any, comp uh, be compensated for that. And then you find yourself on like an Intel blog, and all of a sudden, you know, they're driving all this traffic to their blog there, and ostensibly using what we did. Um, and there's even more egregious examples, for, you know, like imagine finding your piece of artwork on a white nationalist blog. What would you do in those circumstances? What kind of recourse do you have when it's all just out there? And so Saga was like an early, um, uh, like early attempt to just think through some of those issues and say, well, why is it that in the digital realm we've kind of accepted this, this is kind of this common sense realism idea that like, oh, once it's out there, it's just kind of out there, right? Um, and who does that benefit? And so, you know, Saga was and is now a dead project, but the, but the, but the, the, the original idea was saying, no, why can't I have control over my work in a digital space just as easily as I, just as I would do with a, with a piece of physical work that I would choose to put in a room. And when my work is there, why can't I be there with my work, right? So if someone posts a blog post about the work and has an opinion I disagree with or agree with, why can't I communicate with them through the work in that discrete location? Um, and you know, there's uh, long story, there's, there's a whole long story why I'm not working on it anymore. Um, but it does tie into this um, this idea, I think, of, of, of wanting, again, not, not to create impenetrable DRM, as you said, or like go, go back to this time of like wanting to hoard um, information, but, but trying to think of like what a middle ground might be um, and take very seriously the fact that ultimately my, my position that I'm happy to have an argument with someone about is that freedom of information narratives, while they might, while they might sound very seductive, ultimately have helped Google. 
right? Ultimately, they, they have led to the creation of large entities who can, under the kind of subcultural or countercultural cool of sampling or, or dynamic, like move fast, break things, mm. um, uh, feel at liberty to take whatever they want. And that's the, that's the origin story of Google, for better or worse, right? Is that they, they indexed the web without asking anybody. Um, and, and created that, and, and created a new map upon which they could sell services that nobody else could offer, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that connection between, in music or sound communities, that you know, and it's difficult because they say we come from. I've enjoyed a lot of sampling music, and I'm really happy that that existed, and so on and so forth. But, but that kind of countercultural cool, uh, uh, ultimately the same kind of logic has been used to to create. Silicon Valley and, and these impenetrable companies that now you be you know many people will be very very quick to criticize, but when you point at them and say well you know are you doing anything different, um, they might back down a little bit right and that's you know, a much much longer conversation but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I do want to return to that, especially like around the this kind of like maybe success of independent music and how that success becomes kind of like exactly the, the, the structure of domination that exists today. And that's just like, in a, in a, in a way, a description of this dialectical movement. It's not, it's not a failure, it's just a, it's sort of accepting that yes, the success actually has these repercussions and that we also have to move on and develop kind of like new ways of thinking. Uh, that's definitely something I want to talk about. But I think uh, that a little bit what we've been discussing connects to the to the what we have like maybe more broadly talked about in terms of like the right to die, um, the right to be forgotten on the web, mm -hmm. you know, to like not be searched up, f you know, to to just because something exists doesn't mean that it has to exist in perpetuity. Obviously, that that that's in the interest of Google. But it's not necessarily in our interests, mm -hmm. um, and also the right to silence the right to not have to say anything, and maybe like to circle back to the AI a little bit, and these like the generative potential of these uh, uh, neural network models, is that like you're able to reanimate the dead. You're able to sort of create a model from their past performance, from their archive as a data set, and generate something kind of, you know, quote unquote new. Um, but, you know, they chose for one reason or another, whether it's time or a conscious decision not to make that thing that you've sort of generated. So they have a right for that not to exist uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like where it's pushing like uh, sampling from one logic, like, you know, like where it's like this little tiny piece of property and just like who really does that belong to when it originates in a community? Mm -hmm. It didn't originate just in your like, you know, genius brain that originated in a community. So it should go back to the community like, oh, we can get get behind that maybe, but then to have the, the neural network actually generating new material for some person, and that kind of returns it to the metaphor, because it's like the model kind of functions as a metaphor for an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, then all of a sudden, they, they no longer have that right to be silent. They no longer even have the right to be dead anymore, because they're just like constantly reanimated. Uh, and so that's like all of what you're talking about, to me, kind of returns to this question of like the, the, the generative potential of these neural networks. And, and it's just like music is like one very audible um, or sensible way that we experience this. But then like on an everyday level, there's ways that like even after we pass away that our data is going to continue to have some agency, you know, through some, some neural network or another. I know I... I am coming to a question <laughs> again, <laughs> but I was thinking about like like bringing that back to um, these generative models that we see kind of all over the place. And typically, when people work with AI, they're kind of like, "Oh, I generated this like new thing, and it sounds weird. Isn't that really cool?" Mm -hmm. And uh, they just kind of leave it at that. Um, whereas, what I'm quite interested in what you're doing is that like AI becomes a bit of a quasi object. It becomes this kind of like new possible relation between people. Like it's not the end in itself. It becomes like a, uh, it becomes a, a, a form of structure and relationships. So it's like the beginning, it's the first step rather than the, the conclusion. And so in a way I could ask you either to comment on, on that, like the ways that like working with AI kind of restructures the way that you work with other people with your collaborators, way that it generates kind of new limitations and affordances, or alternatively, like uh, we talk about the, the um, generative, um, both music and text and graphics. Um, well, I think we were kind of looking at it as a, as you said, as a new way to collaborate, but as a kind of like 
coordination mechanism. So thinking about it as maybe like the most kind of contemporary um, coordination mechanism that we have right now. And, and I think that's why we created that kind of um, mm, thread between uh, early vocal music, uh, vocal folk music, and um, using the voice with neural networks. Because thinking about early vocal folk um, as like a technology, as a human coordination technology, people using kind of like nasal, like yeah, kind of like uh, singing up in this part of their face to like make the sound travel really far across mountains and to scare predators and all of these kind of things, thinking about it as a kind of coordination, I guess, um, technology. So that's, that's how I look at it, as, as, a, as a kind of new way. You know, I'm always trying to think about how to make the computer a kind of like performance uh, instrument and Spawn isn't really there yet, it, but I'm, we're kind of trying to get there. But for me, it's always about it's about how can I use this kind of, or work with this thing in order to coordinate with other people so that we can play together. And specifically with this ensemble, like how I, I didn't want any anything to get in the way. I wanted it to kind of like augment our communication with each other. Um, so for us, it's like, it's really important that we're able to have these kind of like euphoric singing moments with our ensemble and we don't want working with a neural network to kind of become this kind of like um, awkward or uh, I don't know, heavy kind of process. It's like this block in the middle of it. Instead, it should be kind of helping facilitate that. Um, yeah, I'd just add to that, I think that's, you're gonna say what I said kind of, but the, what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, th th what's, what's funny about these kind of like dead end kind of like neural net machine learning projects or whatever, the kind of demo art component of them, right, is that like, there's a nice, I think there is there is something quite poetic in the sense that like, from the beginning, actually, when we started working on this, the first thing, this was before there was an ensemble in place. And we're like, uh, like, if this record's gonna mean anything, then the technology has to basically be this ambient thing that's witnessing um, real human activity. And what you were saying about with like performance, ultimately that is like that kills or slays all of these, like most stuff that that's discussed around kind of uh, machine learning and music, like the, the these kind of like really dry demonstrations that ultimately like sh demonstrate more what they, what this technique what, what we're lacking than than what we've gained, right? Like mm -hmm. Amazon did a thing recently where they like did some heinous, you know generated audio thing and you think you got to think that they're that the, presumably the state of the art I mean they have a lot of money to throw at this stuff and, and and when you witness it it's like I don't know anybody who would witness that and, and be like wow you know the future of music is going to be incredible it's like <laughs> no it, it, it shows the opposite it, it demonstrates this kind of like you know, bedroom kind of uh, noodling kind of whatever um, and the um there's nothing wrong with bedroom. No, no, sorry, I'm, I'm not. I'm, He's saying I'm tired. it's like I'm, generic, no. identikit, like beat, yeah, yeah, yeah. like rock beat with like. Yeah, exactly. It's it crap. We and all like love the, a bedroom noodle. But that's the thing is like, but but it's funny, funny, like with the record coming out too, because this has been a consistent thread actually with platform, like with platform in the same is like, actually the the boldest gesture that we attempted to make in working with the machine learning was the emphasis on the ensemble and the human voice and the fact that like we were making also, you know, cause th there's this, th when you tour a lot, like I was saying this yesterday in, in, a, in a talk we were giving, it's like, I'm fascinated by the economics of all art basically. Like once you understand it, everything becomes so much clearer. You know what I mean? Like like small economic distinctions and decisions and like how much something costs and who gets the visas and who runs, it's everything. And that's for better or worse, just everything becomes really, really clear. And there's this kind of already, there's this habit of like cost cutting and efficiencies around f the festival circuits and the art market, right? Where, where demo art does do really well, particularly digital demo art where you can just like send a file and it can like appear in every Biennale instantaneously. You know what I mean? Like that, that, and that exists in music too, but is also somehow impoverishing, you know? Um, and so part of the, the grand gesture that might be more appreciated by this room than like most conversations in the world is like, how do we make the most irrational economic decisions on this topic? Because like actually flying a bunch of people around the world to sing is really economically irrational for someone in our position, but is possibly the best thing you could do uh, in, in talking about AI or whatever, uh, or automation, particularly in an electronic music context. 
and that's that, and that's gone over a bunch of people's heads, which is super fine. Um, and specifically with the record, right? Because like when the record comes out, it's like the press is like, AI baby, whatever. It's like, well, yeah, that's, that's, it's like. It doesn't one. matter how many times you try to like point really, yeah. to the yeah, humans yeah. involved. They're just like AI baby. Yeah, that, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, you take what you get. You know, you're not gonna like moan about it. But it's but it's like, but yeah, but that part of like having it be. Tr trying to think of how this couldn't actually augment relationships mm -hmm. and and not exploit people in that process, that was kind of the point. That was like what we spent the most time deliberating about. I mean, we're you know especially because we were touring Platform for a couple of years, and Platform was also that, that was the album before Proto, that, and that was also a largely collaborative album, but it was very much an online collaborative album. So we were really missing this kind of like in physical space musicking with other people. Um, when we were touring Platform, we noticed that a lot of the performance aspect of electronic music was being um, automated by intelligence, intelligent light systems and um, projections. And I'm not dissing that at all. Like I love all of that stuff but it was just kind of making me ask what th what our new role is when we have all of these other things that are able to perform so elegantly um so that's i think that was like some of the kind of early kernel of why we put together a vocal ensemble i mean one uh, one way that i've maybe thought about similar things is uh in observing the way that uh gpt2 um which, if you don't know, it's a language model. Maybe you've played with it, like, it went around a little while ago, but it's a language model by uh, OpenAI, um, which is Elon Musk, and then Microsoft also funded it. But it, it kind of like, you type in a sentence, and it generates the next few sentences, and it's remarkably good. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, uh, you read it, and you kind of think, oh, yeah, like, a human maybe could have done that. Um, and then you just see people sharing it and copying and pasting it, and uh, everyone doing it, and then you see yourself the way you treat it. You keep hitting generate, generate, generate. And there's this like disposability to every single artifact that's generated. And I, I, I guess I was thinking about like when it all becomes data, which is reanimated through, the, uh, through these models, that everything becomes incredibly disposable because the, yeah, the labor doesn't exist anymore. There's yeah. no human labor. So then there's no like, real cost except an environmental cost through the like, running of the servers and the algorithms and stuff. Um, but in, in, in a way, like, because the humans cut out of it, there's a total devaluation of, of life. And so it seems like what, what your approach has done, at least in my reading of it, is to kind of confront that disposability of AI through the kind of like reclaiming of the training process. Um, yeah, th that's, I think we published something, but it was like, yeah, like every step, every time these things get more efficient, it becomes easier to make meaningless art. Mm -hmm. And it takes human beings to give things meaning, right? So like the more abundant media is, and the thing, the thing you don't have to look very far because like we already have gone through this process, right? You, you don't need to, but like the more abundant it is, the easier it is to listen to a random techno track online, the more valuable the thing that sounds a bit different or maybe has a story associated with it or a community associated with it, the more valuable that scarce, rare property becomes because yeah, because it's, it's standing out in a sea of nothingness. Mm. and. That's the thing is like fetishizing how easy it is to generate, you know, fairly competent, meaningless art isn't really that cool unless you are a developer in a research organization whose task has been set to try and render as convincing enough a piece of meaningless art as possible, in which case you have succeeded. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's an impressive accomplishment, but that's not art that I care about. You know, like why would I care about that? That's yeah. But I see. I think the ability to kind of like steal a vibe is becoming no. <laughs> that's something that I care a lot about. Don't steal my vibe, no. Because I think the the, the speed at which you can steal someone's vibe is just going to become like lightning fast with this. I mean, it's something that um, Paley Greetzer writes about. If you guys don't know uh, who he is, I would check out his work. He wrote an article um, for Glassbead a couple years ago where he his research is actually with neural nets and. Um, and comparative literature. So he wrote his PhD thesis for Harvard a couple of years ago on this. Um, and so he's kind of like training on um, specific kind of like literary styles. Um, so that's kind of his background, but he has this thing called the theory of vibe and, <laughs> and how uh, a neural network can, can kind of really efficiently 
analyze and understand the vibe of something um, without really understanding where that comes from and then be able to kind of uh, reproduce that. And so me being someone who cares about like, you know, the, the bedroom noodler who comes up with like the new thing that, you know, is like unique to them and that, that, that noodler to be, for, to have their vibe just taken like that immediately, that's what I kind of get concerned about mm. in this kind of like scary dystopian. Um, could, could I use that as like an opportunity to nudge the conversation to discussing mm. things like, uh, so we've been talking about like uh, AI and how in the production process, but I'm also thinking about the consumption or distribution process and the, the role of AI and maybe even uh, vibe matching and generation and stealing and you know all other kind of stuff with, uh, with platforms like Spotify. And uh, with the act of listening and how, yeah, like the, the, the ways that listening is sort of guided by these uh, silent actors. Um, I yeah. know that's something that you've uh, written and talked about quite a lot, Matt. Yeah, I mean, oh God. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really don't like Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I mean, I think to trying to say something smart, but like, but the parallel there is when we talked earlier about a sense of entitlement, which I think is this kind of, again, like like this very libertarian individualistic sense that you can kind of take something, decontextualize it, and all of a sudden it's yours. I've been really heavily critical of DJing as a practice, even though the, the history is venerable and wonderful, and I have many friends who are DJs and are wonderful. And, but, but, <laughs> but, the, no, but, but the actual act of decontextualizing, I actually had an argument with someone who I won't name on Twitter because I respect him, but like... But we had this argument where he was like, no, 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 like, what you don't understand is that when I take a piece of music and I play it in my DJ set, it then becomes mine. And I was like, well, what do you do to it? Because to me, it sounds like Usher or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> what have you done to this track that all of a sudden it's yours? Like, what entitlement, right? And this is like Lockean kind of like settler colonialist, like, I'm here and I'm making value out of this piece of media right now. The ergo, it's mine, right? It's this very... That's literally what's happening. Though. No, I know, but, 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 it's a, but that's a really long and deep liberal argument. I mean, that's a very profound argument, right? And so taking that and then saying, okay, well, Google you know, did that. Again, kind of booned by this 90s countercultural moment. There's an incredible, uh, you should definitely go and watch like the interview with, I think it's like Chuck D and Lars Ulrich about Napster on MTV and it's fascinating, it's amazing. And Lars Ulrich was actually so spot on, even though he like comes across like a cock or whatever, but like he's <laughs> so spot on in what he says. Um, but, it, but you really get this feeling of this 90s moment where you know tech, everything was possible and it was like, it was gonna be the hip hop moment, it was gonna be the remix moment, right? And how that opened this back door to companies ba to basically say, look, like just trust us, we're gonna reorder everything. Um, and then Spotify comes along, and Spotify very much, I mean, it, this act of, of decontextualizing something, removing any, uh, 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 removing any semblance of information about where it came from, who supported it, the location. By, by design, Spotify alienates that piece of media from anything or any amount of labor or love that went into it by design they're not fucking they're not stupid they know exactly what they're doing they, they, like th that that platform is designed by hundreds of people and you can't find the label you can't find the city very it, you know as little attempt as possible is made to root or situate that media um and ultimately it is again like kind of an act of of displacement and of, and of stealing in that sense right because okay you don't have to put your music on there if you don't want anyone in the world to hear it um right but this, but this, uh, the, the kind of hubris and the entitlement, not only of the people uh, 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 working on those systems, to say, okay, well, we're just going to break up this album. It's meaningless, right? We'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll have these playlists and we'll have a like race to the death of some random anonymous people who probably get paid off a ton of money to run these big playlists. But also of the individual who's listening. I think there's a degree of entitlement there too, where you know the most common argument to justify a Spotify is saying, oh, well, it's better than piracy. It's like, well, that's not really an argument, actually, because right? there is a degree of individual responsibility there. And again, I don't want to be Lars Ulrich necessarily, or kind of like <laughs> tell everyone that you need to spend all this money that you can't earn because of the digital economy <laughs> on albums that don't exist anymore or whatever. But like, but there is a there is a root kind of like original sin there of of entitlement, and we we can nerd about this for a long time. But I, I talk a lot about like Tim Berners Lee or uh, Al Gore and this idea of you know uh, literally HTML, the original sin of HTML being kind of an entitled act, 
right, of saying I can reference anything online on my special page and there doesn't need to be back attribution to where that came from, right? The, the, the HTML allowed that possibility. Um, and I think it is very much this kind of 90s, 80s, 70s, kind of libertarian, Californian um, ideology that, that led to that. And so yeah, anyway, there's a long way of saying Spotify, like, um, yeah, it sucks, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> hi, I, I know that for you, giving, giving credit to the sort of like web of people who are involved in the generation of an idea for the concept of, I mean, it's something that you talked a lot about with platform. Um, and I think it was quite easy because of the metaphor or the like language of platform was already about like the, the fact of the platform as something that's kind of like gives visibility, enables others. You know, that's the 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 the, the role of the platform is to enable the the behavior of other people for other people to like work on and build on and everything. Um, and then as you move to proto, I think like AI as a kind of um, discursive terrain is a bit more opaque. It's a, it's a bit more like black magic or something. Um, and I guess what, what I'm thinking about, I know that that interest, at least in what I've read, in giving credit and acknowledging the others is something that continues. And you mentioned paying uh, the people who are you know, giving their voices to spawn. Um, but in, in light of what Matt was just talking about with uh, the kind of like um, algorithmic populism, that's driving kind of uh, taste on these platforms and things like that. Um, how do you, I don't know, how do you, how do you go about giving credit? Like, like, and what does really giving credit mean? Not you specifically, but even what does it mean to give credit now in this context? I mean, it's difficult because I feel like the whole industry is kind of set up for the kind of uh, genius individual, like the lone genius, like meditating on the mountain or something. Like, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants me to be like some like blissed out synth queen who's just like, I'm coming up with all the ideas myself. And if I push back against that, then I kind of like, I don't know, it's like uh, pulling back the curtain or something and kind of you lose some of the mystique. and. It's happened so often that, you know, I'll have like a really nice interview and I'll talk at length about the people that I work with. And then you read the interview and it's just like me, 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 me. You're just like, damn, you just cut out all of the, you know. So it's actually hard. You, like you have to actively kind of like ask people, can you please print this or can you please like mention people by name? Can you, you know, post people's websites and things like that? Um, so I think it's... <clears throat> You know, in this kind of like attention economy, we're incentivized to just kind of like push ourselves as uh, as individuals as much as possible. So I think it's just like a constant kind of balancing act and uh, I guess a bit of a struggle. I mean, I'm also not somebody who feels super comfortable being the center of attention all of the time. So it's not like something that I have to like meter myself and be like, settle down, Holly, like you're being, you know. Um, but uh yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking a little bit about a comment, because I read the Glass Bead article, which is my favorite thing. I don't know, I like <laughs> that. Um, I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, but With in Alex. that, you, you, make, you make reference to this. Uh, I mean, you you kind of talk about what post-capitalist music might, might mean, or what it might look like. You might not remember it. It was a while ago. Let me fill you in. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> what you said. Um, I mean, you actually, you, you kind of made reference to the, what I think is like an ongoing kind of like fantasy of automation, which is if automation, if, if we manage to displace enough work to technology, then we're freed up to, you know, have these make make the the most interesting decisions or have different relationships with each other like that was sort of like what music in a post-capitalist society might might mean I, I don't know I think um I mean I think that's kind of like what we try to do metaphorically on the stage um so it's like like I was saying before now that we have all these kind of like intelligent light systems and projectors and everything what does that free us to do on stage instead of just like stand there and it means that we can like be joyful together and like hug each other and love each other and enjoy each other and be ultimately be more human together because we have that time and we've been freed up to do that. That's kind of the ideal. Mm. But could you, um, I mean, so this jumps to another interview that I, <laughs> I watched uh, where you're talking about new fantasies and just like that as a musician, you're able to kind of, kind of 
enact these new fantasies or, or put them forward. And I feel like that what you're describing in these kind of uh, shows where there's quite a lot of different people involved, different modes of, of listening and attention and different modes of spectatorship and modes of production, that this, this is kind of performing for, for a certain amount of time, some kind of new fantasy or some, yeah. Um, so maybe well, a lot of that came out of kind of like, uh, you know, like post movement, you know, touring a lot of, uh, I guess, being part of like an electronic music community. There was a lot of kind of like dystopian fantasy at the time, you know, and like there, there's such a history of that in electronic music. And I, of course, come from that as well, like a lot of Warp Records stuff, you know, a lot of that stuff is really amazing. But I was kind of like looking for something that was, uh, I don't know, like presenting a kind of alternative, like kind of looking at it, at, like asking almost for like a seat at the table. Like as the kind of music economy was changing so much, I, I was really wanting like the musicians around me to also be making demands for what they want instead of just like, this sucks, more like this sucks, but what if we did this or um and so for me that kind of like started at home like instead of just being unhappy with the situation or kind of like reveling in the kind of like dystopia of it what if i you know it's actually much harder to come up with a kind of vision of what you want um and i felt like this kind of like dystopian approach felt like kind of giving up power to those who were already in power by just kind of like ceding control in a way um so <clears throat> In a way, my practice, I mean, being someone who's like obsessed with um, vocal processing, I mean, that's from like the, the very beginning is a kind of fantasy moment. I mean, I'm kind of like transcending the physical limitation of my voice. Like, I'm kind of an okay singer, you know? I'm not like an awesome singer. <laughs> so it's like from the beginning, it was like, how can I, you know, how can I do something that's better than myself or bigger than myself or kind of more fantastical th than my physical body? So that's like the very kind of like origins of the practice, I think. Mm. I'll speak to it a little bit too from maybe a different angle. I, I was talking about economics earlier. The one thing that I think is fascinating on the topic, like, okay, like a post capitalist music, right? So, like, there are blissful existences right like so for example if you go to Denmark I did some teaching in Denmark and it was pretty blissful right because you have this like kind of weird model society like quite homogenous but very wealthy um, and there's co-ops everywhere and school's free and I taught at the school that was free and it was full of people who like would have fitted in here and would have like known everything you were talking about and it was wonderful but it was also kind of like this this mo like like toy model that like was just infeasible elsewhere right and like you run into that occasionally with with full respect the academy right like it's kind of like these beautiful kind of like market adjacent opportunities to create what comes across like a utopian thing. Mm -hmm. um, but quite whether that could port over to Dakar, Senegal, or, you know, I, I, it, it's quite difficult. And, and that's like a, a responsibility in the sense that anyone who has the privilege in this <laughs> to be able to work on something with no market adjacency really ought, I think, ought to think about. In our situation, it's really quite weird, right? Because like, I mean, Holly has academic entanglements. I kind of ac have academic entanglements, but n with no gr long term security. You know, it's like I'm like an adjunct professor somewhere. Um, uh, but then we're also kind of like on the fringes of the actual market of music, which is to say that, like, you know, that music is this big thing and we're kind of like a barnacle on the side of it. But, like, fortunately, so far, you know, we can play shows and, and convince most people that we're just like a band like anyone else. But, like, Considering the like research focus in there, everything's like an insane negotiation to make it not just an you know I don't want to be insulting, but like to be something worth worth like that I think would be worth our time, you know, um, or something that that's like rewarding in a way beyond the simple spectacle of going to a music festival or whatever. And so, in a sense, like the post capitalist question, I think is really interesting to me, if only for the fact that it's like how can you make as idyllic as possible a scenario that is not that is actually visible? Because that's a way more difficult question than making in a vacuum an, an idyllic utopian experiment that is not in any way uh, resolute enough or resilient enough to be able to be seen by a lot of people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so the, the real difficulty, and also to do, and, and in a way, like actually when that piece was written, uh, the, the Glass People, this was with Alex Williams, right? Yeah. So Alex Williams, who, for those who don't know, who wrote uh, Inventing the Future with Nick Cernak, 
and was kind of like the left accelerationist type. And it's funny because th they were like the, the, that was kind of the poster book of the left accelerationist. And it's funny because this brings me back to that moment, the idea of a post-capitalist music, because the, the proxy war that was happening discursively at the time was between disc magazine, PC music, these kind of like what I would consider to be in some case kind of like a right accelerationist approach toward things of like run it into the wall, like Nike, McDonald's, you know, like, like, and, and in some way, like make critique from, yeah, whatever, but the, right. And then like, and again, I like a lot of those people, but we have to, you have to have an opinion, right? And then there was like the, the other side of it, which is like, okay, well, how do you not dismiss the potential of new networks and the just be like a, a thar, you know, like like just you know like dismiss all media as being corrupt and cynical, which a lot of it is. But you know, just like be in that mode. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you embrace some of this stuff to try and carve something out that might be positive, even if that might be ultimately be a futile exercise? And that was where platform came from. Was platform was an attempt to be in conversation with some of that stuff that was like guys at the time, but be like, no, hey, like platform co-ops and there's all this cool stuff that you could do that's like maybe less kind of you know libidinal than you know well, I don't want to but that, it, yeah. th that approach is much less functional in a music economy mm -hmm. and I that's mean, the problem then that's, that's the problem and that's a concept we were talking about this yesterday not naming names but like it's really really difficult there because you're like as you said before when you said I try and credit all these people that I work with and then when I read the article it's just about me and my counter argument there is if it wasn't just about you, would we be sitting here? Would we have a career? That's the challenge. Because mm -hmm. culture is like a sieve. You think, you think that you can just make this beautiful thing and then push it through. But things then just get, you know, some things die and then get abstracted. And ultimately, you know, the economics will dictate what products or what people end up stepping through. And so negotiating that is like mm -hmm. stressful as fuck, you know? Um, and also particularly... Especially when you actually care about your collaborators <laughs> and you care about... Yeah. And also particularly because we're, of course, academic adjacent, so we're just corrupted the entire time, right? We're hypocrites. <laughs> Everything we do, we're hypocrites. It's like, no, actually, the most difficult thing to do is to find some way to, to have some of those embers survive a pass-through. Uh, 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 it's uh, a yeah. Trojan horse. Yeah. You have to, in some ways, Trojan horse mm. it. And I can also see the appeal of uh, universal basic income which is something that's come up a few times uh, around you. And um, like in a way, like what you really want is not necessarily to develop the perfect system so that everyone is re remunerated precisely for the contribution that they put in. Like that kind of like accounting, that it's over, a nightmare. overzealous yeah. accounting is just like, yeah, it's horrible. You just want everyone to like not have to suffer to live. Like you never want people to, you know, like it's the basic communist creed, yeah. like, you know, to everyone according to their yeah. need. Like everyone gets what they need. And that's Simple as that. That's, well, that's also the challenge when it comes down to these machine learning systems on that bigger level is it really is a, a socialism or barbarism scenario, right? Because these things work with a lot of information. Mm. Small, local, like you don't have the local farmer's market version of big AI, if you want to solve cancer, you have the data of the entire country working together. So that's either And also by the ability to be able to kind of like zoom in and find out who contributed what like tiny little piece to each model is, that's just like, yeah. that's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and I, and even like, like I was all on board for a universal basic income for some time. And then I like was, uh, I forget who it was. It was someone on Facebook who's incredibly smart. And they were, they were sort of describing how, well, yeah, but once you start doing that, then everyone's rent goes up, and then also social services just get eliminated because everyone's given the choice with their new money to spend their money on. And I was like, oh, fuck, you're right. Like, yeah. That's a really bad idea, I guess. And uh, you know, I was, I was <laughs> miserable afterwards. going, well, what's the answer? Um, I realize we're getting, like, it's, <laughs> it's been an hour already. And I don't know like how, uh, I obviously want to open it up, and I also don't want to like make you suffer. <laughs> and I don't know how much time we have and everything, I but there's like one question that I had, it's probably the shittiest question, but it is a question that I was like, I quite wanted to ask. Um, so I just want to make sure I do it before I, I like <laughs> ask you how you feel. Um, <laughs> um, and it's, 
oftentimes like we're always looking for like continuities and like what 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 is it you know that has been a, a persistent kind of consideration from like the earliest album to the newest one or from when you were a student to now and so on. But I guess I'm like, I'm kind of interested in the discontinuities and like the like breaks and like when you've changed your mind or like certain, I guess I'm wondering like what sorts of things have like, you know, reality intervenes in 2017, 18, 19, I don't know. Um, that makes you think quite differently than you were thinking before. And I guess I was just wondering if there was anything like that um, for you. I'll just like, while you're thinking, I'll just offer up. No, okay, you're ready? It's funny because yeah. the opposite is often asked, what is the continuity? Mm -hmm. But the discontinuity is never asked. So that's, a, that's an interesting Very question. Discontinuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just, I, I, you have one. Well, I, I do because oh, I mean, uh, I'll just speak for myself. Like uh, the past couple of years, working on these projects and other things in parallel, I've fallen in love with, I've fallen out of love with all of the subcultural things that got me into the situation in the first place. And that's really trippy. And like quite like, what was the word? Like, um, uh, uh, unstabling, what, what's the word? Destabil destabilizing, thank you very much. Um, yeah, destabilizing. It, um, and that, that's been like a weird, which I think is maybe like a, a something that you can say is su a successful byproduct of a of a successful art process or whatever. If by the end of it, you're like, oh, whoa, I actually, I think the opposite of, you know, and if I thought that at the beginning, I probably wouldn't be here now. I might be doing something else. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, that's. Well, this is more of a musical thing, but I've been thinking a lot about what it means to have a protagonist lead vocal and also on a stage, what that means to be like a front woman or like, you know, cause now I have this ensemble of people that I'm working with and what it, is it possible to kind of like have play that role, but then also to kind of like pass that baton over and then have someone else be the front person for a little bit. That's something that we kind of play with a little bit. And I don't, it's not fully baked, but it's something that we're kind of experimenting with. Yeah, I, I, I thought, I, I don't know if it's the same thing, but one thing I've thought about is like, I think when I was younger, like trying to set up projects so that power didn't exist or something. Yeah, yeah. And then kind of like coming to the realization that like power is always there, like whether you want it to be or not. And so it's funny that you bring that up because some of the early experiments that we did, we were like, we want to try some like non hierarchical <laughs> jam sessions. And they were like the worst jam <laughs> sessions ever. It's like, turns out you need somebody to like kind of, you know, intervene. But that was actually really important that we went through that kind of process of being like, okay, no, I have to be the leader here, but that doesn't mean I have to be a shitty leader or like mm. an asshole. Like you can actually be like a, a, a kind and uh, 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 you can be a leader and still have the kind of like, power dynamics not be so hierarchical or so stable or so fixed yeah. right. or pro Exa like exactly. their property or something exactly. yeah we'd, we'd done on, on a similar note like we talked a lot about like in a way society pushes you into like power exists ambiently whichever way you deal with it like even bullshit things like crediting like mm. the economics of crediting someone over time or paying someone out I had a f conversation with a, with a friend who's like a visual artist and, and specifically about this and he's like yeah you'd think it was more progressive to give everyone equity in this thing. And he's like, I did th this for a period of time. And then you think about it and it's like, actually the accounting mechanisms to do that don't exist in the art world, really. Right. So what you're doing in there is you have to then would have to like add a levy onto the, the amount being paid out to pay for an accountant to take care of it, which ultimately means that by the end of it, everyone it probably isn't less. worth as much unless, someone, unless the one piece becomes worth 60 million dollars. But this is something that really turned me off of uh, kind of more classical or neoclassical or whatever co contemporary ensemble music um, work because I noticed that if I didn't kind of exert myself as this kind of like super dominant like I know everything composer and you're doing it wrong and like I don't know like th there's this kind of like S&M kind of like dynamic between performers sometimes where they want to be told like no you're fucking it up like work harder and like that's like not <laughs> how 
how I like to work with people. And I had a couple experiences where I had to like hire a conductor to do that. And then the pieces were really good, but I couldn't do that myself. Like I couldn't embody that. So yeah, it's really, it's yeah. Finding the right kind of like um, communication balance with an ensemble is like, that, that's probably the hardest thing actually. Like the writing of the music is much less difficult than like finding that right kind of communication balance with people. Um, Joel, time? You, you guys, time? Like, how are you feeling? I don't yeah, let's do some questions. Okay. Would you mind if I had a, yeah, yeah. Had a beer? Yes. Would that be possible? Thank you very much. Could it's, I have a water? Yeah, here. This is a perfect... Oh, water. I've sort of been, like, waiting for the right moment. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, but I'll bring you, a beer well. thank you very much. Would you, would you like a... I'm okay. <laughs> this is actually a perfect time to... Um, I, I uh, have an experiment that um, not not a I don't really care if you do it or not, <laughs> but I just wanted to try it out, which is that I set up a, a, a wireless router, uh, and it's not connected to the internet, but it is on Wi-Fi. Um, and as we move to Q and A, like I actually hate speaking in public, <laughs> unless I have a. a You've done an amazing a, job for someone who hates that. speaking in public. Um, but I would never ask a question in a uh, in a thing like this, certainly not with so many people. Um, but if offered the ability to write something, like I probably would. So I set up an offline um, wireless router, and it's uh, uh, inhuman intelligence. And if you downloaded an app <laughs> uh, called uh, Manyverse, which is built on a like peer-to-peer -peer, um, protocol uh, called Secure Scuttlebutt. <laughs> You know, that kind of thing. Uh, anyway. It's from, called, from New Zealand, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so if you download Manyverse and join Inhuman Intelligence, then you might be able to... Uh, it basically looks kind of like a shitty Facebook. <laughs> but the, the, the great thing about it is that uh, all the data is stored on our phones because it's not online. It's not going to any centralized server or anything like that. Uh, and so when you take it home, like uh, you have it, and then maybe even if anyone joins and becomes friends with me, then um, we're friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> Life. Um, so yeah, like. How do you join? So okay. I mean, I've, I'm, I've so got you download app. it. Yeah. And then uh, the, the, at the top, there's two things. There's a kind of like a bulletin board or briefcase. And then there's like a globe connected to a wire. Mm. And if uh, you connect to the globe, uh, connected to the, oh, I'm not online. Whoops. You're going to be able to ask questions with your voice too. Don't think that <laughs> <laughs> this is the only way. Because uh, you need to, someone has to be, like you're our access point, right? Oh, four people on it already. This oh, shit. Awesome. What am I missing? Thanks, everyone who's game. <laughs> um, Although I remember there was like a similar system at a tech conference that we went to and you used the opportunity to ask the presenter. Oh, about money laundering? Yes. Yeah, Cause really you good. knew that their system did not have a. Yeah, it was anonymized. It was amazing. And it was voted that up was to the so top. It was so awful cause the presenter was like. It was voted up to the top and she didn't answer it. Which sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was a crypto conference, yeah, obviously. Mm. So I'm FC3B, <laughs> F1A. <laughs> Uh, this, it probably won't work, but you can try it, and I'd be super. Can I get a question from the floor in the meantime? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the meantime, <laughs> <laughs> kill me. 